In this video, you will learn about the history, especially the art history, the architecture of the Renaissance era, why the Medici were so important for the city, the most important sites and places, and food. If you want to check out our funny discussion, it's right at the end of this vlog. We visited four of the largest cities in northern Italy within nine days. We landed in Milan, took a train to Turin or Torino, went from there on to Verona, from Verona to Florence or Firenze, and from there back to Milano. Firenze is actually not part of northern Italy anymore, since it is the capital city of Tuscany, which is located at the middle or so-called heart of the country. The city is famous for its countless architectural masterpieces and the art history of the Renaissance. The series is called How to Fail Dolce Vita because it is the Italian expression for sweet life in Italy. And we did definitely not experience a sweet as in relaxing time there. We really had to take in a lot of sour stuff that happened to us. We arrived at a pretty ugly and small main train station of Florence, not the one that we left with at our last day to Milan. We were just lucky that we found this kiosk or like small shop that sold actually freshly made sandwiches. By the way, this one is my favorite coffee and you should definitely try it when you're in Italy. It's kind of like a frozen ice cream coffee type. So we didn't have any orientation when we arrived because there was nothing around. This was really an exhausting arrival for us. I'm not going to elaborate on that. For those of you who have no clue about historical eras of Europe, Florence was the beginning and catalyst for the age of rebirth, as the French word Renaissance states. So what kind of rebirth are we talking about? It is meant the rebirth of the antiquity era, so like ancient Greece, that brought people from the Dark Ages, so the Middle Ages, to the 15th century into a modern way of thinking, here in Florence. The Medici were once selling textile and made a fortune out of it, which they used to gain the trust and popularity of Florence's people. Through this powerful family clan, the city completely transformed. Florence became the European center of politics, trade, finances and arts. Also, there were three popes and two French queens who were descendants of the Medici clan. So I think you can imagine now how much power they actually wielded. Michelangelo relished a special bond between himself and the Medici family. Lorenzo de' Medici took him into his home so that he could teach him like all his sons and daughters about philosophy, science and especially art. Michelangelo soon grew into the favorite artist of the Medici and through their funding and the wealth of this family, he could live his dream profession and create art in the best city possible during that time. After a century has passed, you could see Florence striving in ancient arts, architecture that would pass beliefs and all kinds of sciences. Education has indeed become very important in the Renaissance era. In the medieval or so-called Dark Ages, the most people weren't educated at all and couldn't read or write. That is why the Catholic Church held their influence over them through images. It is in this era that humanism is introduced. Humanism is a rationalist outlook or system of thought that centers the autonomous self or the human 
and ignores the boundaries of the divine. Humanism is the view of the world that states that the human has the ability to become a genius in all disciplines, godlike, and that a human is the center of the universe, which is a huge contrast to the centuries before, where people just believed anything the Pope or Church would tell them was true about God or rather what was possible for humanity or what the Pope or Church would tell them they themselves were capable of. Architecture On August 19, 1418, the Arte della Lana announced an architectural design competition for the construction of the dome of the Cathedral Santa Maria del Fiore, or also known as the Duomo di Firenze. The two main competitors were two master goldsmiths, Lorenzo Ghiberti and Filippo Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi was supported by Cosimo de' Medici and won. He received the commission for the construction. It was the first octagonal dome in history to be built without a temporary wooden supporting frame. It was one of the most impressive projects of the Renaissance. Although the church had not believed in the possibility of humans creating a dome that could stand on its own and therefore did openly display how they would not support the Medici's idea for the blueprint. Brunelleschi and Medici went through it anyways and built the dome after their imagination. This brought a clash of beliefs with it. The wisest of humans, the head of the Catholic Church, said God wouldn't have given us men the power to execute architecture like this. I don't know what their real motive was, but they were wrong about that. Because of this mistake, people started to doubt the church. This led to the new age of humanism. What they were told was proven wrong. They could do anything they wanted. They weren't actually limited by God. So, from now on, Christianity lost its centuries-long power position over the mindset of the Florentine people and the Medici have replaced the power of religion with the power of knowledge and money. Sites and places to visit Galleria dell'Accademia Relatively small and there is not so much to see compared to the Uffizi, but it is significant and the best part of it, the price. First things first, on their website they somehow state that an adult has to pay 20 euros, which might be true, and a reduced ticket for a student for example would be around 10 euros. So they only say reduced ticket, but there is no price for an actual student. So from my experience, I can tell you that's so much less that you pay because when we just stood in line and paid directly there instead of booking it ahead, she actually told us that if we we're a student and we were young enough, like below 25, then we would only have to pay two euros per person, which is such a completely cheap price. This is nothing like anywhere in Italy for a museum. Try to go directly to the cashier, even if you have to wait up for a half hour in line. It's always, always worth it to ask if there is a reduced price for students anywhere in Europe. If you don't have a student ID, it might be risky, but many people I've met uh, that work in these shops don't even ask about it. So just try it. The Academy of the Fine Arts was established in 1563 and was the first school in which drawing, painting, as well as sculpture techniques were taught in Europe. It was the first fine art school of Europe. As I said, Florence made a huge influence on the world of art and the artists industry to come. The artworks displayed here since 1784 should serve the art students as visual aids for the purpose of using them as templates. The most precious artwork of their collection is the David, 
by Michelangelo. It is the biblical hero who fought against the giant Goliath and went victorious due to his cleverness out of the fight. His win shall represent the win of the Florentine people over tyranny. Galleria degli Uffizi Cosimo I built it at first for office purposes. Later generations of the Medici used the rooms for their vast collection of art treasury. And this is how the oldest art gallery of the world came to life. So the Uffizi complex is actually the largest building in Florence. That means it takes up to five hours to roam around this building and see everything you would want to see. Now, I personally did not go in there, even though it was a dream of mine to see it. I mean, I will visit definitely Florence once again in the future, but I'm just saying we only had one full day to discover the city and the art, so I focused more on the Galleria dell'Accademia instead of the Uffizi. The Piazzale Michelangelo was our first stop where we just brought our luggages right after we landed in the main train station. It is such a beautiful outlook on the city. A must see when you're in Florence. At least if you just want to see Florence from above once or you want to take marvelous photos or videos. You can also find another replica of Michelangelo's David here on this place and take a picture with him. If you're there, you're probably going to get thirsty, especially in summer. There's a really beautiful restaurant called La Loggia, which is right behind the scenery from where you can look over the beautiful city. It has really this luxurious atmosphere, but I can recommend you, you can sit down there if you're just ordering a water. So that's what we actually did. This is a real low budget tip. So if you're okay with the waiter staring at you like, what? You just want water? If you can leave this feeling aside, it's a budget saver. And I'm telling you this because all of the drinks on the menu were quite expensive, especially the food. So the water was around 2 to 3 euros. A Coke was, I think, around 5 to 7 euros. So you can imagine. <laughs> Piazza della Signoria. It is the political heart of the city, due to the location of the town hall Palazzo Vecchio here. This is where the Florentine citizens would gather at public meetings, the so-called Parlamento. If one wants to describe this place, one would say it is a unique park of sculptures. The stages here remind of situations that took place in the history of the city, like the rise and downfall of the Republic. So the Palazzo Vecchio, the town hall, is actually super beautiful. The inside interior is completely carved in marvelous little figures or paintings all over any wall or column. And what I definitely recommend you to do is what I could not have done. I was too late, but usually the upper part of the town hall is open to the public. That is actually the really beautiful part of the town hall. So if you're especially interested into architecture and seeing beautiful rooms, then you should definitely check out the first floor of the town hall, but you cannot go up there for free. This one room here on the ground level is for free. Piazza della Repubblica. This piazza was established on top of the old market, the Mercato Vecchio, and before that there was the Roman Forum. On the west you can see a triumphal arc which was built in 1895 when Florence was announced the capital city of Italy for a few years. Shopping. Piazzale di San Lorenzo. You can shop anywhere in Florence. There are so many beautiful shops for clothes, but they're probably 
kind of expensive and not that unique. On the other hand, you have the San Lorenzo market where you can get unique locally produced souvenirs or bags, anything that is made of leather and or the Mercato Centrale, which is just nearby, but it's only food section. Just be sure to be there before 2 p.m. because when we arrived, they were closing already. I was just really rushing to get these video shots. Ponte Vecchio. The Ponte Vecchio is the oldest bridge of Florence and was built in 1345. And it was the only one that was spared by the troops of the Nazi Germans. It has always been a place for trade. Back in the old days, there were butchers who sold their meat, as well as tanners who produced leather, and blacksmiths who sold their metalworks. All of them disposed their waste into the river. They were banished from the bridge in 1593 by Duke Ferdinand I because of their extreme stench and noise. Instead, goldsmiths and jewelers settled in, which is why it is today one of the hotspots of the city if you're interested into buying pricey, high-quality jewelry. There are about 11 palazzi in Florence. They are from the wealthiest families that have ever lived there, but I'm only going into the most important one, the one from the Medici. Palazzo dei Medici Riccari is called like that because the family Riccari moved in after the Medici have left. In a Renaissance palazzo, in a building like this, there are three floors. In the first floor, this is like the entrance hall where they are receiving their guests. The second floor is home to the owners, so the wealthy family. And the third floor, the one that has the smallest rooms, is for the servants, the maids and the cooks. The chapel is probably the most precious indoor architecture of Florence. There are so, so many frescoes painted by the best artists of that time. There are so many gemstones and precious resources that were used to build this room. All of that just makes this room so magnificent to look at. The Medici Bank was the largest in Europe during the 15th century and it facilitated the Medici's rise to political power in Florence. It was a new world, full of possibilities and opportunities. The Medici supported the establishment of new art objects like frescoes and sculptures everywhere, even under the peasants who usually couldn't afford any artworks. Because of that, the Medici were extremely valued by the Florentine citizens, at least at the beginning of their political power, or rather, hereditary reign. In 1532, the family acquired the hereditary title Duke of Florence. In 1569, after territorial expansion, the duchy was elevated to the Grand Duchy or Duke of Tuscany.
can you actually imagine that? They made their way from completely normal traders to aristocracy, to royals. They actually came from a pretty normal wealth class. They are the personification of if you work smart enough, you're able to reach anything and achieve as much as you want. The Golden Hall of the Medici Riccardi Palazzo is magnificent and has a large fresco which was drawn by Luca Giordano and it shows a lot of mythical episodes and interlocking narratives which depict the Medici family in its center. For example, it depicts the triumph of the Medici in the clouds of Mount Olympus and like this should mean that the Medici are compared with the Greek gods and like the Medici is Zeus. This is, by the way, the same place where the Medici used to have their bank and where they received all their customers from all around Europe and Florence. The Medici started their business in the 12th to 13th century and officially ruled over Florence from the 15th century on, when Cosimo de' Medici rose to the political power of an uncrowned monarch in 1434 until the 18th century. When the last Medici Grand Duke Gian Gastone died in 1737, without a male heir, the dynasty died with him. So, okay, I really have to tell you this story because it's too funny not to share. On our last day in Florence, I booked via Airbnb an experience that you can make yoga with a yoga teacher in Tuscany at her house and she would pick us up in Florence and then take us for a drive about 30 minutes into the countryside of Chianti and it was a lovely landscape but it was also pretty hot during summer and a lot of mosquitoes were flying around at that time and one reason why I wanted to book this experience was because me and Celine were quite new to the yoga world and she was really into sports and I wanted to experience for once yoga in like in a different perspective because I thought you know she's doing this for a living it's such a different experience to learn something from an Italian local maybe so when we arrived there we should sit in and meditate or like clear our mind and it was impossible for me to do so because all the time Time, there were mosquitoes flying around I heard them I felt them and like literally I I actually regretted that I wanted to do this yoga experience in her garden instead of in her house 
but I still thought I just have to concentrate, I just have to keep going. So when we were really doing the yoga, Celine was a natural, of course, she did it perfectly, the poses that she wanted us to do. And me, on the other hand, of course, I'm not that sporty, I haven't done yoga as often as Celine, but my main issue was that all the mosquitoes seemed to like me and they bit me almost every five seconds. So there was really no room for me to concentrate on the beautiful aspect of nature and calm my mind. So this is how we must have looked like from the perspective of the teacher. I was like constantly scratching my butt and other parts of my body. Meanwhile Celine performed everything that we were supposed to do. So at the end this experience wasn't for me <laughs> or at least it wasn't because of the mosquitoes which is such a shame. By the way, in the Airbnb experience was also an organic food included, which was amazing. So for 40 euros per person, you got an exercise, you could see a little bit of Tuscany and you met a local. But more importantly, we could try freshly baked walnut bread and her own harvested olive oil. So she actually told us that everyone who lived on the countryside of Tuscany had their own olive trees. So if you haven't noticed, olive oil from Italy is something that is seen as a pride for Italians. So if you have your own garden, you should harvest your own olive trees and sometimes they would have to make these kind of olive oil tastings. Someone would bake bread and then you would try the olive oil of your neighbors. And like she told us secretly, everyone thought to themselves, well, my olive oil is the best anyway, but it was just kind of a Tuscanian neighbor tradition. Yeah, by the way, she was the one who recommended to me a very special tip. If you go on top of the West Inn Hotel, you'll have a stunning view over Florence and it's completely for free. And a bonus is that you don't have to spend money to visit the terrace. You don't have to eat there. We just went on top and it was all good. And a double bonus is if you have to pee, their toilet is more than luxurious and perfect. They even have free woman supplies if you have your period. It's completely worth it to at least go once inside there because it's a five-star hotel and yeah, it's just an experience and we went there at night time so it was something completely different to see Florence from above at night which rounded up our stay pretty well because at the first day we saw Florence already at daytime. Yeah and shortly after because it's just close to the main train station we left. Pasta! I'm sorry, I really tried to find the name of the restaurant, but I can't. It's in the near of the Duomo, just right in one of the smaller streets, which are still quite busy since it's around one of the most important sites of Florence. And it's fairy tale themed. So inside the restaurant, there were a lot of little light bulbs and also there was a drawing of a fairy tale figure on the wall. It was pretty magical. And the food was also nice. I think I tried truffles pasta. We went to eat at the Piazza di Santa Maria Novella, which is at the main train station where we had to take our train to Milano. And yeah, we ate pizza and pasta. I tried something with cheese, pepper, and it was so delicious. We drank Aparo Spritz which I shouldn't have done, more on what happened in the Milano vlog. Diary! Day one! We were really tired, so we didn't do much except for, of course, checking our apartment out. We for once had more than just one room. We had also kind of a living room and a kitchen, a balcony, and yeah, we were just happy with everything until it came to the topic of food and we had to go to a grocery shop nearby and you'll see. <laughs> Es ist immer noch bessere Pasta als bei uns im Supermarkt. Leute, das ist mehr Essen. Mehr Lasagne als ich im Restaurant bekommen habe von der Menge her. Also. Look at that. And it cost a third of it. Was hat man bezahlt von der Lasagne? 
Was 10 das? Euro. Ey Leute, das war so. Hey, wie klein, wie, wie, wie hat das gekostet? Immer so 3 Euro, ne? Ich hab diesmal Carbonara. <lacht> Second day. Unser erster Morgen in Florenz. Wir haben uns gerade Frühstück gemacht. Wir haben hier Cornflakes, hier schon im Apartment waren. Joghurt auch. Ein paar Obststücke, Kaffee, Instant mit Milch, Brot. Cornflakes mit Milch, Eier. Ja, es wiederholt sich nur wieder. <lacht> Last day. Wieso oh. <lacht> eben? Sie beißt mit ihr Brot, weil wir haben leider keine Butter. Mann, ist das trockene Fuck. Ich muss sie so lieben, Öl. Das haben wir schon mal gemacht. Und dann denkt sie sich immer, oh nein, das ist zu viel. Nee. Ich wusste, dass du das sagst. Ihr Brot nicht weiter essen. Das ist zu trocken. Das ist literally Pappe. Und das war noch das Beste, was es da gab. Ja. Und das Ei, sogar das Ei schmeckt noch nicht. <lacht> schmeckt dir das Brot? <lacht> Schon fast nur von einem Wissen. Du vermisst Deutschland jetzt nur wegen dem Brot und dem Ei? Wegen der Küche und diesem scheiß Fiesta. Mhm. Ja, aber ich meine, Pizza und Nudeln ist schon besser hier. Ja, das war so. <lacht> If you want to know how the story goes on, watch my next part, where we are in Milano. And get to know why we really didn't like this city. If you like this video, please give me a huge thumbs up and subscribe or you can just follow me on my instagram account naps travel diaries where you will see all my travel photography right at the moment where i'm on my travels and every update in my story and you'll get to know tips and facts about where i'm traveling and philosophical statements or poetic quotes so don't miss out on that i hope that you could hear how fantastic this city is to me and how much I love digging into the history of Florence. This is honestly my favorite city of all Europe just because I love the fact that it is the art metropole, so to say, since the Renaissance times. And I'm an artist, <laughs> that's why I just feel drawn to it. I hope you could hear in my voice that I love talking about it and I wish you a wonderful trip if you go there.